In August of 2011, the Cayuga Lake Floating Classroom discovered an aggressive invasive aquatic plant in the mouth of Cascadilla Creek and in Cayuga Inlet in Ithaca, New York. Called hydrilla, this plant threatens to ruin the entire waterfront and poses a threat to Cayuga Lake and beyond. A team of scientists and other specialists has jumped on this environmental emergency. Hi, my name is Holly Menninger. I'm coordinator of the New York Invasive Species Research Institute located in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University. And I've been part of the Hydrilla Task Force that's trying to determine our rapid response to this new invasive species here in the Cayuga Inlet. So we're standing right next to Cascadilla Creek, site of one of the largest infestations of hydrilla within the Cayuga Inlet. It's the beds of the plants start growing around the Ithaca Farmer's Market docks, all the way around um, up the mouth of the creek here near the kayak and canoe launch where we're standing at the Farmer's Market, and all the way down, um, all the way up, I should say, past the haunt and the Route 13 bridge. Uh, this is just one of the dense infestations. We have several located throughout the inlet, as well as plants growing even at depths of 12 feet in the inlet. You're probably wondering what hydrilla is. <laughs> it is a nasty, inv invasive aquatic plant native to Asia. And this is the first detection of hydrilla in central New York. And we are very concerned about the potential for this species to spread and take over the inlet and spread out into Cayuga Lake and the adjacent Finger Lakes and possibly even the Great Lakes. It grows very quickly, as much as an inch to day, in, as much as an inch a day, up to lengths of 30 feet. Can grow at really um, in some deeper water. So as I mentioned, we have found it growing at 12 foot depth in the center of the inlet. And the really bad thing is that it spreads very easily. The plant stems are very fragile, and so they can break into small fragments. And those small fragments can float and be blown across the surface of the water by wind. They can also hitchhike on boats, on propellers, and on trailers, uh, on kayaks and canoes even. And um, even paddling action can break up some of the, the stems into smaller, into smaller fragments. So that's one way the plant spreads. Another way that it spreads and why we're really concerned uh, about the timing of our, our reaction to this plant is that it, very shortly, it will be making these tiny little vegetative buds called turions. And we can kind of think of those as spawn of hydrilla. And those also float, and they're going to be taking off in the water, spreading through the water. Again, they'll easily hitchhike, and they may even uh, hitchhike onto water birds, potentially, and will certainly float out into the lake. Uh, the plant also, uh, the reason it's able, it's from tropical areas of Asia, but the reason it's able to survive here in Ithaca is because it puts down in the, for the wintertime, these, these root-like structures, uh, storage structures called tubers. You can think of them kind of like bulbs or potatoes, and those can survive the winter. So even if the inlet ice is over, we're anticipating that those, those tubers will survive and they may live up to 10 years, and, and each year new plants can sprout. So unfortunately, I think hydrilla may be with us for a little while, but fortunately, I think we caught it within maybe the first two years of its infestation. So we have a real opportunity to do something to eliminate the plant from the, the inlet and hopefully slow its spread, contain it, and get rid of it so it doesn't spread. If we do nothing, the plant will grow and grow and grow. And so we could anticipate the inlet not being usable, maybe next year, uh, certainly the following year. We know that waterways and other states that are infested that haven't done anything or that they got on top of the problem too late uh, have had, had issues that their, their waterways become completely blocked. And so particularly for us here, we're concerned where, where recreation and fishing are, are, are a big deal and an important part of our economy. Those industries will be hurt quite significantly if the hydrilla is left. To, to grow. Your boats would get stuck, no one would be able to canoe or kayak, certainly you couldn't fish, people aren't going to want to swim, water intake pipes could be clogged, uh, and it would cost a lot of money to sort of clear those waters. In fact, in Florida, where they haven't been able to really control the hydrilla, they just manage the problem. They spend between 18 and 30 million dollars a year to just make their waterways passable. The good news is right now, because we think we caught the infestation in the early stages, we have not found dense populations of hydrilla out on the south shelf of the inlet. We've looked really hard. We, we were out in boats 
for a whole weekend and surveying 350 points across the South Shelf and particularly focusing our efforts around the Stewart Park area because when things come out of the inlet, they swirl around and get blown against the shore at Stewart Park. And they and we would have expected to find beds there, and we did not find any. So we're we're keeping our fingers crossed that that we caught this early, and we're starting to do survey efforts at other places along the lake, potential hot spots, so boat launches and marinas, because we know that uh, certainly the plant may have hitchhiked on a trailer, a boat trailer, or on a boat that left our waterway here and went and went to another waterway. I should also say that in terms of it's not just recreation and tourism that will be hurt with the hydrilla, it's an ecological disaster in, in the making. I mean, the plant will cover the water surface and sort of choke out and shade out all of the other native plants that grow there. It, in creating these really thick mats, they will sort of cause declines in dissolved oxygen in the water, and, and that's going to really hurt the fish. Fish get very sensitive to sort of declines in dissolved oxygen, and so we may see fish kills. And in some other states, particularly in the south, where they've had hydrilla for quite a while, they have found uh, where there's hydrilla, there tends to be increases in blue-green algae, which is a toxic algae that produces neurotoxins. And those neurotoxins have been responsible for killing water birds. And, and those water birds are prey for bald eagles, so they've actually found deaths of bald eagles to be associated with hydrilla infestations. So uh, it's both an ecological and an economic um, concern. Here we have some hydrilla, uh, of the dense bed of it, and some pieces that have blown up against the shore. So all in here, it's kind of growing amidst some other plants, but you can see it surf popping out at the surface. And then if you look a little bit further out in the water, you can see sort of a dense mat of vegetation between the shore here and the, the covered slips for the boats, and that's probably also hydrilla. We had, we, with the the big rains and the hurricane rains and, and the higher flows, you know, we think that pieces of hydrilla, likely the fragments were probably floated away, um, probably floated into the lake, but we think that any plants that were rooted in the streams, and there were a lot of those, probably stayed put. Unfortunately, I think because the way, the direction of the prevailing winds, that uh, fragments that blew out of the inlet likely sort of blew back against the shore and as the high water sort of dropped, we will want to go take a look at Stewart Park along the edges to see if there are some hydro hydrilla fragments that blew in there. This is hydrilla. It looks very similar to Elidea and may look like a common aquarium plant to a lot of people. In fact, that's how it first got to the U.S. was because it was brought in as an aquarium plant that uh, then someone in Florida dumped into the waterway and from there it, it spread. Hydrilla is generally characterized by having five leaves that grow sort of in a circle around the stem that's called a whorl. So they can have, there's some variation there, it can be four to eight leaves, but typically we've been seeing hydrilla growing with five leaves arranged almost like a star around, around the stem. And then if you look really closely at the edges of the leaves, they are serrated like a steak knife might be. And so you can see tiny, tiny little teeth. It differs from Elidea, which is a plant particularly out in the lake, is a plant that grows very commonly. We saw a lot of Elidea during our surveys. And Elidea, at uh, first glance, looks very similar, but instead of having five leaves growing around the stem, it has three leaves growing around the stem. And uh, Elidea does not have those, those sort of tiny teeth on the edges of the leaf. Uh, docks and boats are going to have a really hard time if hydrilla grows and spreads along the edges of their docks. Even uh, there are some people that get their drinking water and their water for their lake homes from the lake. Those pipes could get clogged and they may have a, have a really difficult time and certainly they'll have a hard time getting their boats in and out to those docks and they won't want to go swimming in those waters. You know, people in Ithaca have, have dealt with invasive plants in our waterways for a while. We have something we have Eurasian water milk oil and folks who were around in sort of the 60s and 70s, that was a huge problem. Uh, the problems with milfoil have really declined in recent years because we, there are some natural enemies of, of, of milfoil that have helped, helped keep that plant in check. And I've talked to a few other experts and they say that the milfoil really par pales in comparison compared to um, hydrilla. Hydrilla is, um, is so much worse than milfoil.
much more aggressive, grows a lot faster, and, and is able to really choke the waterways much more so than, than Eurasian water milfoil ever has or could. So that's another priority area for us, for our survey efforts, and tomorrow I'll be working to help train a whole army of people to learn survey methods to go out and look at the north end of the lake and even in the locks, potentially, uh, for the hydrolift. We're trying to impress upon people that why this is such a big deal, uh, because this is the first, other previous detections of hydrilla in New York State have been in small ponds or in ponds that are really contained and haven't been connected to other waterways. And this is the first infestation that's happening in a waterway where the potential for it to spread throughout the region, um, throughout Cayuga Lake, throughout the Finger Lakes, into the Erie Canal, into the Great Lakes, is, that potential is enormous. And that's why we need to sort of take this opportunity, if we have it now, uh, because we think we caught it early, to stop it here, keep it here, um, and get rid of it here, and don't let it spread to other places. That most definitely an ecological emergency. I can say too that folks, I, with, with Hydrilla, everyone can take some responsibility to, to do something, uh, particularly if you enjoy being out on the water in a boat, uh, particularly whether it's a motorized watercraft or an unmotorized watercraft, like a canoe or a kayak. Everyone needs to take some responsibility. Learn what the plant is, be able to recognize it. It looks quite similar to another native plant that we have called Elodea, to be able to know the difference. Take a look at one of our maps that we have, and you can see the maps of where those infestations are on the Tompkins County Cooperative Extension website, just cce.tompkins.org, and you'll see a link right there to Hydrilla. So avoid those beds where, where it's most densely infesting, and then um, follow clean boating practices. That means that you need to check your boat, look for pieces not only on the outside of the boat, but on the trailer and bait wells around your motor and any other nooks and crannies where, where things may, may hitchhike. So you need to check, and then when you remove that material, you need to put it in the trash or up on high ground. Please do not throw it back in the lake. Clean your boat, especially if you're moving from one waterway to another, so check clean. And then finally, dry. Hydrilla dries out very easily if it's not in a moist place, and so if you can let that boat dry out for three days, even a week would be better uh, before you move to another waterway, the better off we'll be. People who don't have boats, talk to your friends who do have boats is what we, uh, if you don't have a boat, uh, please help us spread the word. We have volunteers that are staffing an information outreach booth at the Ithaca Farmer's Market, and they've been doing that for the last three weekends and will continue to be at the Farmer's Market throughout the boating season. And you can come see live specimens of hydrilla to learn what it, what it looks like and, um, and so that you can help spread the word. You can also talk to our elected representatives and officials and talk to them about your concerns about this plant and the need for us to act quickly to do something, because if we do nothing, our problems are going to be enormous in the following years. So there is a task force that is comprised of scientists, not just from Ithaca, but from um, other states where they've been dealing with hydrilla problems, and so they're advising our efforts. The city of Ithaca is involved, Tompkins County is involved, a number of state agencies, including the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and State Parks, because they own a marina at the open mouth of the lake, uh, and a number of, of stewardship organizations like the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. All these folks are working together and thinking about what our potential management options are, evaluating what might be the best for us now, and then organizing outreach efforts. And so really, given the sort of size of the infestation and the, the location of the infestation and the time of year, we have to act quickly because of those vegetative buds could spread. We really have just a couple options. One is uh, removing the, the plants mechanically with divers using assisted by suction harvesters and, um, or potentially using herbicides. And unfortunately, given the extent of the infestation, divers aren't going to be able to catch every single plant. And if we let just one plant go, uh, those could be producing those buds and our problem will still be with us in, in even bigger extent next year. And so we're thinking that herbicides and might be our best option to knock back the plant, stop it from growing any further, stop it from making those tubers, stop it from making those turions, and help us buy ourselves some time so we can garner together resources and expertise so that next year we can go back in in the spring as the growing season starts and take more effective action, possibly going in with divers and hit every, every single plant. But no option has been fully decided on yet. We're still in the process and there's an opportunity for folks to learn more about those different management options and, and weigh in. And again, you'd want to visit the Tompkins County Cooperative Extension website to learn about that process. 
The city of Ithaca has made this announcement. While the city pursues emergency treatment options in collaboration with the county and the state, officials are strongly discouraging the use of boats in the inlet. All boaters are urged to clean their boats and trailers thoroughly before and after entering the waters of Cayuga Lake and the inlet to prevent the spread of this species to other water bodies. Washing stations will be set up in Allen H. Treman Marina and other locations.